So we will discuss the scope of common commercial policy and the implied EU competencies with regard to the objectives. Huh? So the first question uh, raised uh, by the new generation of free trade agreements to be concluded by the Union is uh, that of the competence uh, of the Union to conclude them. As we know, the principle of conferral, saying that uh, the Union acts uh, only within the limits of, si of its competence, applies uh, both uh, to the internal and to the external field. So the question is, what is the competence of the Union? to conclude a, a, a new generation of a free trade agreement. The competence of the Union, the external competence of the Union, may be expressed or implied. Express means uh, provided in the treaties, or implied, stemming from the internal competence. The express external competence of the Union may be exclusive or shared. Uh? If it is exclusive, it means that uh, the agreement is to be concluded by the Union only. If it is shared, there there is the question, is it going to be a mixed agreement or not? Mixed uh, in the sense uh, concluded on the one hand by the Union and its member states and on the other hand by the, the third country. So the express external competence of the Union provided explicitly as external in the treaties, may be exclusive or shared. The implied uh, external competence, according to uh, ERTA judgment uh, of uh, uh, 71, according to which uh, the Union has a competence to conclude an agreement as far as it has an internal competence. Uh, so the implied external competence may also be exclusive or shared exclusive EU-only agreement, shared, a mixed agreement. Uh, it's a uh, question to be seen, uh, to be discussed. Uh. So the exclusive or shared character of the Union's external competence does not depend uh, uh, on uh, the uh, express uh, or imp implied nature. Uh. An express competence may be exclusive or shared, an implied competence also may be exclusive or shared. In order to determine the competence of the Union, to conclude an agreement, one has to specify the legal basis huh, for the conclusion of the agreement. The choice of the legal basis, as we know, is function of the objective huh, pursued by the agreement. At first, uh, at first sight, uh, the objective of the new generation of free trade agreements is uh, international trade. So their aim uh, is to establish a free trade area, to liberalize and facilitate trade and investment between the parties, so the new generation of free trade agreements as free trade agreements could be seen uh, as falling under the scope of the common commercial policy. The common commercial policy is an express external competence of the Union and exclusive one. So uh, in such a case, the Union concludes uh, trade agreements alone, are EU-only agreements. So uh, if uh, an agreement falls under the scope of uh, uh, an express external competence, then we know if it is exclusive or shared. So a common commercial policy is an exclusive competence. However, new generation of free trade agreements contain, in addition to classical provisions uh, concerning the reduction of custom duties or non-tariff barriers to trade uh, in goods and services, contain provisions on matters uh, related to trade, such as uh, intellectual property protection, foreign direct investment, which falls now since the Lisbon Treaty under common commercial policy, but also contain provisions on investment protection, public procurement, competition, sustainable development. It is a comprehensive approach. Eh? This uh, global comprehensive approach is explained by the reforms of the Lisbon Treaty concerning namely the global approach of the Union's external action objectives as uh, codified in Article 21 of the Treaty of the Union, the European Union, uh, which expresses the final objective of the Union to be a global uh, international actor. Consequently, there is an uncertainty as to the scope of the common commercial policy, which stems for the, from this uh, uh, 
comprehensive approach which incorporates other provisions, various trade-related objectives, but not necessarily trade objectives. Huh? As a consequence, the first question raised with regard to the competence of the Union to conclude that the new generation of free trade agreements is the scope of the common commercial policy. The express exclusive external competence of the Union uh, under which falls uh, at first sight uh, uh, a trade agreement. So the question is, uh, are new generation of free trade agreements to be considered as agreements falling under the scope of the common commercial policy, under the express exclusive EU competence? The answer to that question is given by Opinion 215, eh? delivered by the Court of Justice of the European Union on 16 uh, May uh, 2017, with regard to uh, the nature and the scope of the external competence of the Union to conclude a free trade agreement with the Republic of Singapore. The importance of uh, the opinion goes beyond uh, the envisaged agreement, uh, the agreement with Singapore, and covers all new generation free trade agreements because the Court of Justice uh, explained the scope of the common commercial policy with regard to trade-related provisions and held uh, that uh, the new generation of free trade agreements contain provisions which do not fall all uh, under the common commercial policy. These provisions, which do not fall uh, under the common commercial policy, fall under other fields of competence, internal, but uh, that uh, they give rise to an implied uh, external competence. In such a case, the question is not uh, so much what is the legal basis for these provisions, which do not fall under the common commercial policy, but the question is, uh, the legal basis is an internal competence provision, but the question is rather to know whether the Union has an exclusive competence to conclude the agreement. So the question is not uh, if it is a, in cer um, a transport policy or environmental policy, so much the legal basis, but rather the nature of the competence of the Union. In other words, uh, when uh, we uh, examine an implied external competence, we have to see if it is an exclusive one that gives a uh, uh, place to an EU-only agreement or a shared competence. The question is those, uh, whether the criteria of Article 3, Paragraph 2 are fulfilled. Article 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union gives uh, the list uh, of uh, the fields uh, of external, ex of, uh, excuse me, of exclusive competence of the Union. We have uh, the fields uh, of exclusive competence where we see under E the common commercial policy. But uh, the second paragraph of Article 3 is a provision, provision which uh, does not refer to a specific field. It concerns the exclusive nature of the Union's external competence, the exclusive competence to conclude an international agreement with no reference to a specific field. That is why, beyond the common commercial policy, when we are in a field uh, falling under implied external competence, meaning uh, based on an internal competence, uh, giving rise to an external one, implied, the question is not so much which legal basis, but uh, is it an exclusive or shared uh, competence to conclude an agreement. Article 3, paragraph 2 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union gives uh, the criteria of the exclusive character of the implied external competence of the Union. This criteria, as we see, According to this provision, the Union shall also have uh, exclusive competence for the conclusion of an international agreement when its conclusion is provided for in a leg legislative act of the Union or is necessary to enable the Union to exercise its internal competence or insofar as its conclusion may affect common rules or alter their scope. This is a case examined by the Court of Justice in Opinion 215. Uh, this is a codification of the Earth judgment. Uh, the question to know whether the conclusion of an international agreement is liable to affect 
common rules adopted in the internal level in the Union, in the European Union, or alter their scope. So in other words, uh, while in the internal field, uh, the question is, what is the objective of an act and what is the legal basis? In the external field, uh, the question is, does the Union has exclusive competence to conclude an international agreement? This question prevails over the question, what is the legal basis for the conclusion of the agreement? Does the Union have exclusive competence? Shall we have an EU-only agreement or a mixed agreement where the competence is not exclusive? So if uh, at first sight uh, the, the, the agreement falls on the common commercial policy, trade-related, the first thing we are doing is to see if uh, it falls in its entirety under the common commercial policy, in what case it is an exclusive competence of the Union. So the first question is, uh, what is the scope of the common commercial policy with regard to the new generation of free trade agreements? If some provisions fall outside of the common commercial policy field, then uh, the next question is, has the Union an implied exclusive competence to conclude the agreement? So let's see, first of all, the first question. What is the scope of the Union's exclusive external competence in the field of, the com of common commercial policy? We have to uh, see Article 207 of the Treaty uh, on the Functioning of the European Union, which gives uh, the definition of the common commercial policy. According to this provision, the common commercial policy shall be based on uniform principles, means exclusive competence, particularly with regard to changes in tariff rates, the conclusion of, of tariff and trade agreements related to trade in goods and services, and the commercial aspects of intellectual property, foreign direct investment, the achievement of uniformity in measures of liberalization, ex export policy, measures to protect trade. So the important element is common commercial policy covers provisions related to intellectual property, to services, and uh, to foreign direct investments, which are fields uh, uh, falling under the scope of uh, the free trade agreements and the Singapore, EU-Singapore agreement. Article 207 in paragraph 5 explicitly excludes transport from the field of common commercial policy. According to this provision, the negotiation and conclusion of international agreements in the field of transport shall be subject to ta Title VI uh, of Part Three, and not to Article 218, uh, and excuse me, to Article 218 co according to uh, um, the, the, the procedure of conclusion of international agreements. So it does not fall under common commercial policy. We know already that some provisions of the new generation of free trade agreements relate to transport policy, so they do not fall uh, under uh, common commercial policy. What about investment? According to Article 207, common commercial policy covers direct investment provisions, foreign direct investment provisions. So uh, the Court of Justice had uh, uh, to uh, define the scope uh, of uh, Article 207 beyond transport policy because there it is clear that we are not in the field of common commercial policy. So the Court of Justice in Opinion 215 first uh, uh, followed a classic approach uh, to the common commercial policy. According to this classic approach, uh, the Court of Justice refers uh, to previous judgments uh, and uh, held uh, that uh, it is settled case law, so a classic approach, that the mere fact uh, that a union act, such as an agreement, is liable to have implications for trade with uh, one or more third states is not enough uh, for it to be concluded that the act must be classified as falling within the common commercial policy. The important element is the following. On the other hand, an EU act falls within uh, that policy if it relates specifically to such trade. In that, uh, it is essentially intended to promote, facilitate, or govern such trade and has direct and immediate effects on it. So some provisions may be trade-related, but it is not enough. The question is, uh, 
not only to affect, have some effects on trade, but uh, provisions of an agreement need uh, to uh, have uh, as main objective huh? the regulation of international trade and at the same time have uh, effects on international trade. So this is a classic approach of the scope of the common commercial policy, classic since uh, the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, because we will see later during the, dis the discussion that uh, uh, before the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, the court has uh, sometimes had sometimes followed an instrumental approach. But since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the court established a case law according to uh, which uh, uh, one has to examine the objective and uh, the effects uh, of uh, an international agreement. So according to uh, this uh, classic approach of international trade, of the scope of the common commercial policy, Article 207 covers market access for goods and services. It was without difficulty that the court acknowledged uh, in Opinion 215 that uh, the exclusive competence of the Union in the field of common commercial policy covers the provisions uh, relating to market access for goods, uh, services, including measures to protect trade, the application of technical and sanitary standards. Huh? Also provisions related to market access for services included both cross-border supply and supply by establishment as well as the presence of, legal, of natural persons. Huh? All these aspects uh, fall under the definition of the common commercial policy. Um, In the same field, uh, uh, market access for goods and services, the court uh, uh, also held that Article 207 covers provisions of uh, um, the Singapore uh, EU agreement concerning commitments on the principles of non-discrimination and transparency in procurement procedures, uh, which uh, were considered as ancillary provisions huh, linked uh, to uh, those covered uh, from the common commercial policy. So Article 207 covers market access for goods and services, covers foreign direct investment provisions. Huh? It is clear from the wording of Article 207. The court uh, uh, explained in Opinion 215 that uh, foreign direct investment consists of investments made by natural or legal persons of the third state in the European Union and vice versa, which enable effective participation in the management or control of a company carrying out an economic activity. In the same field, uh, Article 207 concerns both admission and protection of investments. Uh, the court uh, held that uh, investment protection provisions may touch upon public order or public security requirements. However, it uh, held that the limitation of the discretion of member states is inherent in the conduct of international trade. It does not give rise to an exclusive member state competence. So as far as uh, common commercial policy covers direct investment provision, it covers also measures uh, related to the protection of the investments. Common commercial policy covers also intellectual property protection. It is also clear from the wording of this article that uh, trade-related aspects of intellectual property fall under common commercial policy. Covers commission commitments concerning competition. It was the case of chapter 12 of uh, uh, the EU-Singapore uh, Free Trade Agreement. Uh, the court held that uh, the obligations of the parties to ensure enforcement of their respective legislation with regard to free and undistorted competition form part of the liberalization of trade. So they fall under the scope of common commercial policy. However, common commercial policy does not cover non-direct foreign investment provisions and cross-border transport services. As to transport services, well, already um, indicated paragraph 5 excluding transport from the scope of the common commercial policy. Concerning non-direct foreign investment it was not clear. The Court of Justice in Opinion 215 held that uh, acts concerning investments that do not result 
in lasting and direct economic links, thereby enabling the investors' effective participation in the management of a company, do not have uh, direct and immediate effects uh, on international trade. And thus, uh, the scope of common commercial policy does not include, uh, does not cover these provisions. In other words, uh, the Court of Justice, despite the wording of Article 207, according to which uh, common commercial policy covers foreign direct investment, examined the effects uh, of provisions concerning uh, um, investments which uh, do not uh, lead uh, to an effective participation in the management of a company and held that in that case there is no direct effect on trade, so common commercial policy does not cover non-direct foreign investment provisions. As uh, it has been mentioned, so does not cover uh, cross-border transport services, which uh, uh, is a field excluded from the scope of the common commercial policy. Before uh, going to the question so what uh, is the nature of the competence for these provisions, uh, which are outside the scope of the common commercial policy? It would be interesting to see another part uh, of the position of the Court of Justice in Opinion 215, which is no more a classic approach of common commercial policy, but uh, gives uh, a new position with regard to the absorption of sustainable development commitments from the common commercial policy. The question was to know whether sustainable development commitments of the EU Singapore Free Trade Agreement fell under the scope of common commercial policy. In that uh, sense, uh, Opinion 215 gave the Court of Justice the opportunity to apply this part of Article 207, first paragraph, according to which the common commercial policy shall be conducted in the context of the principles and objectives of the Union's external action. The Court of Justice explained that uh, the principles and objectives of the Union's external action are specified in Articles 21 first paragraph and uh, paragraph 2 of the Treaty of the European Union and uh, they relate inter alia to sustainable development linked to preservation and improvement of the quality of the environment and the sustainable management of global natural resources. The European Union has uh, the obligation to integrate those objectives and principles which have uh, a horizontal, a transversal character has the obligation to integrate them into the conduct of its commercial policy. This is apparent from the first paragraph of Article 207 in conjunction, read in conjunction with Articles 21 and uh, also 205, uh, uh, which uh, refers to uh, the conduct of the whole external action in the light of the objectives of the Union specified in Article 21. It is thus a global approach of external action objectives. Common commercial policy cannot be seen uh, as an isolated objective, but uh, trade policy, common commercial policy, is to be conducted with respect to sustainable development objectives. So. Uh, in the case of 215, of Opinion 215, the, the EU uh, Singapore Free Trade Agreement contained uh, provisions intended to ensure that uh, uh, trade and investment relations uh, are conducted in accordance with uh, the objective of sustainable development, comprising sustainable management of global natural resources, social protection of workers. Huh? So what is the position of the Court of Justice? Because of this global approach of objectives, of external action objectives, the Court of Justice considered that uh, as uh, sustainable development objectives ha have a horizontal character and as the common commercial policy is to be conducted according 
to these objectives, taking into consideration these objectives, as a consequence, common commercial policy covers provisions related to sustainable development commitments. It means provisions concerning uh, the respect uh, of uh, environmental international agreements, the respect uh, of social rights of workers. These provisions could have been considered as falling outside of the scope of common commercial policy and as giving place, giving rise to another competence of the Union. The Court of Justice could have considered thus, uh, that uh, this provision are not the main objective of the agreement and, though, and thus they are absorbed uh, by the main trade objective. However, the Court of Justice did not apply the absorption doctrine, did not consider that these provisions are absorbed uh, by the trade objective. It considered that uh, the objective of these provisions is part uh, of the trade objective. In other words, uh, the trade objective cannot be seen without taking into consideration the sustainable development objective. The Court of Justice thus concluded that uh, the objective of sustainable development forms an integral part of the common commercial policy. So the Court of Justice did not apply the center of gravity test. Huh? It should be noted that uh, uh, the Court of Justice considered that uh, these provisions do not create, do not give rise to specific obligations. It means uh, there are no, th they do not introduce new norms, huh? new regulations. Huh? And in that sense, uh, uh, they cannot give rise to um, a specific competence, huh? another competence of the Union. It did not take explicitly this position. The Court of Justice took the position according to, the, to which uh, the objective of trade policy comprises, covers the sustainable development objectives. In that way, the Court of Justice avoided the risk uh, uh, of conflict of legal basis to uh, consider that there is a legal basis on environment or social rights and another one on trade, but uh, enlarged uh, uh, the approach and the scope of the objective of common commercial policy. And it concluded that common commercial policy covers uh, these uh, provisions of sustainable development on social and environmental protection and as a consequence these provisions fall under the exclusive competence of the Union. It was not the position of uh, the Advocate General Sharpstone uh, in uh, her opinion it was not the position of uh, a large number of member states, but it was the position of the court and it was the first time that the Court of Justice gave uh, an autonomous meaning in uh, the provisions of the treaty according to which uh, the external action of the Union is to be conducted following the objectives of Article 21 which uh, comprise uh, sustainable development objectives. Now, the question is, uh, what about provisions which do not fall under the field of common commercial policy? Sustainable development co provisions fall under the field of common commercial policy because of the broad approach of the objective. But what about the other positions? Indirect investment and the transport provisions. Huh? As far as these provisions do not fall under common commercial policy, it means that uh, they do not fall under ex explicit uh, external competence of the Union. So the question is, uh, what is the nature of the competence of the Union? Can the Union approve alone also these provisions of the treaty? Now we have to move uh, towards the field of implied external competence uh, and uh, see how the Court of Justice interpreted the criteria of Article 3, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. The Court of Justice examined more precisely and following the arguments advanced by the Member States and the institutions, the last criterion, the affectation of common rules. So the question to know 
whether the, uh, this new generation of free trade agreement, EU-Singapore, is liable to affect common rules in the fields concerned, and which are the fields, transport fields, and the movement of capital, so non-direct investment. So the question is to know whether the new generation of free trade agreements are li liable to affect common rules or alter their scope. First of all, concerning uh, the cross-border transport services, the Court of Justice followed uh, the same uh, broad interpretation of this affectation of common rules criterion, which is already established in the case law. According to this uh, broad uh, conception, broad interpretation, uh, the Court of Justice held that uh, it is not necessary that uh, the areas covered by the international agreement and the areas covered by internal EU rules, it is not necessary that uh, these areas coincide fully. So the Union may have uh, an exclusive external competence because the internal rules are to be affected, even in the absence of what we call conflict preemption, even if there is no direct conflict between internal rules and international agreement, even if uh, the field is not entirely covered by internal rules. It is sufficient, according to this broad conception of the Court of Justice, that the internal rules cover a large part uh, of a field, and the question is uh, a comparison between uh, the internal rules and uh, the international agreement to see if uh, the international agreement falls under a field largely covered by common rules and thus the application of the international agreement coincides with the objectives pursued by the internal rules, even if there is no direct conflict, no, no, not exactly direct correspondence between the internal rules and uh, the provisions of an international agreement. So the Court of Justice has established in uh, its case law a broad conception of this preemption, external preemption, which is broader from the internal preemption. No? The analysis takes uh, into account, of course, the areas covers by, covered by the internal rules and by the provisions of the international agreement, but also they are future development of the internal rules, huh? the nature and the content of the rules. Huh? in order to determine whether the agreement is capable of undermining the uniform and uh, consistent application of the EU rules and also the proper functioning of the system they establish. In other words, the Court of Justice examines the internal rules as a whole, as part of a field, and uh, takes into consideration the impact of the conclusion of the agreement in the functioning of the system in this field. So even if there is no strict correspondence between the internal rules and the international agreement. So in uh, this paragraph 201 of the opinion, the court refers to the previous case law, which uh, expresses this broad conception of the affectation of common rules criterion. In opinion 215, op the uh, advocate general Sharpston adopted a more restrictive approach, uh, argued that the competence of the Union should be exclusive only with respect to those provisions concerning trade in rail and road transport services and that the area of liberalisation of maritime, maritime transport, air transport and transport by inland waterway services, are they, they are fields which are not largely covered by common rules. The Court of Justice does not follow this restrictive approach, followed a broad approach However, it also admitted that uh, provisions with regard to inland waterway services do not fall under, the, under a field where we have common rules. So, however, it held that uh, these provisions do not have a very important place uh, in the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. And as such, they are absorbed uh, by the other uh, transport-related provisions. So, it considered, it, 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 it held, the Court of Justice said, uh, held that uh, uh, because the European Union has uh, exclusive competence to approve uh, 
commitments relating to maritime, rail and road transport, and that because of the broad conception of the affectation of common rules criterion, it has also exclusive competence with respect to the entirety of the provisions concerning transport. So the affectation of common rules criterion led the Court of Justice to conclude that commitments concerning also public procurement in the field of transport fall also under the exclusive competence because they are provisions that follow the substantive provisions on transport services. What about provisions related to non-direct foreign investments? There, the Court of Justice followed also a classic approach of the affectation of common rules criterion. And why uh, a classic approach? Huh? Provisions concerning non-direct foreign investment could not be assessed uh, in relation to secondary EU law, to internal rules, huh? because such rules huh, do not exist. We are in the field of free movement of capitals, where we have only primary law provisions. Huh? However, the Commission advanced an argument related to a new approach of affectation of common rules criteria. The Commission, the European Commission, suggested that exclusive competence of the Union may stem from the overlap not only between uh, the provisions of an international agreement and secondary EU law, but also between uh, the provisions of the international agreement and primary law and provisions of the treaties. According to this argument of the Commission, provisions of the Singapore EU agreement related to non-direct foreign investment may affect Article 63 of the Treaty of the Function of the European Union concerning the freedom of movement of capitals. The Court of Justice did not follow this argument of the Commission. Advocate General Sharpson also rejected this argument. The Court of Justice held that uh, Article 63 cannot be viewed as a common rule in the sense of Article 3, Paragraph 2, in the sense of the ERTA doctrine. The Court of Justice underlined that uh, also in the light of primacy of EU law, in the light of primacy of the treaties over acts adopted on the basis of the treaties, including international agreements. International agreements cannot have an impact on the provisions of the treaties. So we cannot uh, advance an argument according to which an international agreement may affect uh, primary law provisions, and as a consequence, we have an exclusive competence of the Union according to the affectation of common rules criterion, because primary law provisions are not to be considered as common rules in the sense of the earth adjustments. As a consequence, there is no exclusive implied EU competence for provisions on non-direct investments. So the two categories of provisions falling outside uh, the common commercial policy. Transport services provisions, they fall under exclusive implied competence. Non-direct investment provisions fall under shared implied competence of the Union. So some provisions of this new generation of free trade agreements do not fall under the exclusive competence of the Union because they do not fall, these non-direct uh, investment provisions, they do not fall under common commercial policy and uh, they do not fall under an exclusive implied competence of the Union according to the criterion of Article 3, Paragraph 2 of uh, the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. So the Court uh, held that uh, the European Union does not have exclusive competence to conclude an international agreement with the Republic of Singapore insofar as uh, it relates to the protection of non-direct foreign investments. 
this uh, absence of exclusive competence covers also the ancillary provisions concerning uh, transparency and uh, other uh, procedural provisions that uh, we can discuss uh, later on. But the conclusion of the court in paragraph two, uh, 244 of the 215 opinion is that uh, section 8 of chapter 9 meaning uh, provisions concerning uh, non-direct uh, non -direct foreign investments, these uh, provisions cannot be approved by the Union alone because uh, they do not fall under the exclusive competence of the Union, uh, neither common commercial policy nor affectation of common rules criteria. So the question is, uh, what is the meaning of this paragraph of the opinion? Does it mean uh, that uh, um, the EU-Singapore free trade agreement and as a consequence all other agreements containing non-direct uh, um, investment, foreign investment provisions is uh, to be uh, concluded as a mixed agreement because the Court of Justice said that the agreement cannot be approved by the European Union alone. Uh, this is uh, the topic of uh, uh, the, uh, the, next, uh, the next seminar. For the moment, we are staying uh, uh, to uh, the nature of the EU's external competence.